The following is a presentation of 99.3 County FM, the voice of the county in Prince Edward County, Ontario, Canada. Welcome to the County Naturally. I'm Pamela Stagg. Today, a huge grassland restoration. We will not only have benefits like ecotourism, we'll have carbon sequestration. A recent trend in conservation has been the reintroduction of once native species to their former habitat. The results can be remarkable. When Yellowstone National Park increased its plains bison herd from 24 animals to over 5,000, the improvement in Yellowstone's grassland could be seen from space. An American foundation, Rewilding America Now, has plans for a 70,000-acre rewilding program using bison and mustangs, traditional animals of the North American prairies. Joining me to talk about it is Dr. Ross McPhee, Curator Emeritus of Vertebrates at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City and Director and Head Science Advisor of Rewilding America Now. Welcome to the program, Ross. Hello, Pamela. Ross, 70,000 acres is a huge number, even by Western standards. It's not all our land. In the U.S., there is a section of the Department of the Interior called the Bureau of Land Management that oversees the federal lands, really almost half of the country. Lands that most people would consider fairly marginal, largely pasturage for beef cattle and recreational hunting, trapping, camping. But the amount of land is truly enormous. What we're talking about for rewilding America now is an area that's in southern Idaho, just north of the State River drainage area, in a place called Birch Creek. Birch Creek is on one side ringed by the Rockies toward the east, grassland areas, tall grass and short grass, going into foothills. And the reason why that's important is because the horses that we're going to be importing there are built for it. That's not the case for bison. Bison are flatlanders, and we've got sufficient flatland in the immediate areas. It's also very dramatic in its scenery because it is right next to the Rockies. Birch Creek, a valley, is 400,000 acres in size, and we have 1,300 acres that we've purchased, and the rest is allotments. What that means is that we have the right that we pay for to graze livestock, We are the first and only outfit that has applied for grazing rights for horses. There's grazing rights for cattle, also for bison, but nobody has tried to go for horses before. This isn't just any piece of land. It's the missing link in a wildlife corridor that will connect some major chunks of conserved land in the American West. Our ultimate hope is to be able to create a corridor between Yellowstone Park and the interior of Idaho. The interior of Idaho is called, for very good reason, the wilderness, because it's quite mountainous. What we would like to be able to do is recreate the conditions when large mammals, also birds, also invertebrates, everybody who's out there, could have easily made migrations on whatever their cycle or annual moves were like. That's largely disappeared And this is probably the last place in North America where it would be possible to recreate some of these conditions. Our reason for wanting to do this is to show what can be done with mega herbivores, with the big guys like horses and bison, to recreate conditions for prairie to blossom again in places where they've been extensively degraded. Many areas have been overgrazed, and along with overgrazing comes loss of soil, because there's no root systems to bind the soils together. It comes with tremendous depletion of the microbiomes that used to exist there. We want to see if we can recreate that within reasonable timescales. What are microbiomes? A microbiome is largely made up of very small organisms at the level of bacteria and viruses that are associated with larger organisms. For example, it's nitrogen-fixing bacteria associated with root systems. When you convert a diverse, productive prairie with probably hundreds of different species down to, say, wheat, you have cut through the microbiome that used to live there. And once you lose that, the only thing you can do is let everything go fallow and hope over time that you can reintroduce the microbiomes and bring the prairie back to what it was long ago. 
And that's one of the things that we're certainly interested in doing, reseeding with native plants that have been excluded so that we get the kind of diversity that would have existed in these places tens of thousands of years ago. Ross, the Rewilding America Now project isn't just about putting animals on the land. As you said, it's about restoring and maintaining vibrant natural grassland ecosystems. So let's start there. If we go back 50,000 years, we had bison from Asia and horses, which were native to North America. These two species shared the North American landscape, but they also shaped it. I would want to add one more kind of mega herbivore to the horses and bison. Mammoths were very important species, let alone the other big herbivores that would have been around mule deer, pronghorns in the North Caribou. But they all would have been doing much the same sort of thing, consuming very large amounts of vegetation because they're big animals, and what they're eating tends to be fairly low in nutrients, so they have to be bulk feeders. When they're consuming, they're also taking on seeds and spores that they will take to other places. And once they defecate, they're putting those particular seeds in circumstances that they might not have otherwise gotten to. They're very important as ecosystem engineers being able to perform these requirements that the plants have for getting around in the areas in which they're likely to be successful. Once you remove the big herbivores, you don't have anyone doing that job, and that shows in various ways in the American West with the extirpation of particularly perennial species, native species adapted to those conditions, who have trouble with seed distribution if they don't have big herbivores munching on them. One of the things that perennials do, for example, is that they send out really big root systems. That helps bind the soil. It helps trap carbon, another advantage, especially nowadays. Once you lose the perennials and you just have these short-rooted annuals, then definitely it has a pronounced effect on the health of the prairie. You mentioned carbon in connection with roots. The roots of a tall grass prairie species like big blue stem grass can go down over 10 feet into the ground. In fact, there can be as much as 10 tons of grass roots per acre of tall grass prairie. Ross, how does this translate into carbon storage? You can say that a great way to store carbon is in trees. You have the enormous plant that sequesters whatever carbon is in its framework. The difficulty comes along When the tree dies, it simply collapses onto the surface, begins to rot. The carbon that was contained in it goes back into the atmosphere, which is exactly what we don't want these days. If, on the other hand, the storage unit is actually the soil, roots, then potentially at least the carbon stays there even when the plant dies. Whatever those plants have by way of carbon is going to be a persistent feature of that ecosystem. And that's what we should want. Ross, Rewilding America Now is undertaking a project to help recreate vibrant grassland ecosystems. How long might that take? Our only useful guidance comes from the experience of people who've been doing it in Europe for now several decades. I'm thinking particularly of the organization known as Rewilding Europe. What they have been doing is the same thing that we're interested in doing which is not to pretend that we're going to go back to an exact early state when everything was pristine before people showed up. That's not on. What we're talking about, what we're trying to do, is make conditions as optimum as possible for a very healthy and very diverse kind of plant life to exist in these places, which means that you'll also have the fauna associated with highly productive, healthy prairie all the way from invertebrates to small mammals to large mammals to birds feeding on the seeds, feeding on the small animals, in the case of the raptors. In other words, you get a functioning ecosystem. It may not be exactly like what existed there in the distant past, but it will be functional. Where we're going in southern Idaho is fairly marginal. It's very close to desert. The amount of rainfall per year is only around 10 inches, and it shows. But in theory, it should be possible to get a grassland going that will be much more productive. And if we are successful in getting our corridor going, carnivores will be able to traverse this corridor in the same way that the big herbivores are. And you get the kind of interaction that you'd expect in nature, which is what we want, something that resembles what nature is really like. 
Ross, how will you decide whether the project is a success? Success is a measure that is only going to come to fruition over a number of years. What we're doing to start with involves taking inventories, especially of the plants to begin with, but then of the insects and other organisms that would be of interest, and in those same places over a period of years, see what happens. So let's look at plants first of all. Where we're talking about right now is an area that has a lot of bare areas. There's nothing living plant-wise. And what we are hoping to see is that as the big herbivores are carrying seeds around and depositing them with their feces here and there, we will see a regeneration of species that are native to the area. And these empty patches will be covered. We're also looking for diversity. So we want to extirpate grasses that really don't belong in favor of grasses and forbs and other species that do belong so that over time, what we'll see is that kind of transformation. Will it look like much in the first five years? No. Will it look like much in 10 years? Hope so. Will it look great in 25 years? Absolutely. What we want to see is grasslands being grasslands. I'm going to interject here with an observation about how most people feel about grasslands, which is that they're sort of a a big waste of space. Why aren't they all in forest? Everybody loves trees. How can you possibly love a grassland? Well, most of the big herbivorous mammals all over the planet are grassland-oriented species. These are big animals relying on fairly low-nutrition diets, and they have no choice except to eat a great deal but all the throughput is changing the plant matter. That's what we want to see. By focusing on that and telling people this is what you should be looking at, diversity is everything when it comes to life on this planet. There will be benefits like carbon sequestration and the number of animals that you will be able to see, wolves, grizzlies, wolverines, bears, beaver, all of these animals used to live in that area and they don't know. One of the things that surprises me is the number of wild horse tours being offered from Alberta way down to Nevada. Clearly, ecotourism is a benefit of a rewilding project like this. It is. Getting people out in places where they can appreciate nature, it speaks to the soul. And it's not what you get when you go to a zoo. It's also not what you get when you go to sanctuary-like conditions where everybody's housed in a corral, but they're not part of the landscape. What we want to do is to get away from that. And you can do that in a place like southern Idaho because the expanses are really vast. You will be able to see horses and see bison being in a landscape that is getting better and better all the time by virtue of their presence. It's about taking advantage of the way in which we know the natural system used to work and reinstituting that. Reintroducing large mammals onto the landscape isn't as easy as letting them out of the trailer and watching them gallop off into the sunset. When bison were reintroduced to Banff National Park, they were helicoptered into the backcountry in shipping containers. Hopefully, it will be easier to bring bison and wild horses to Birch Creek, Idaho. I wish I could agree with you, but it won't be. They don't live there now. You still need to bring in trailers and you still need to pack in the animals, in this case, over fairly large distances. But we know that. It's going to be a major effort to begin with, but the hope is that both groups are going to do just fine, living their lives and eventually contributing to the rehabilitation of the prairie. Nobody leaves once they're there, because one of the things we want is to have carcasses on the prairie so that the carrion feeders can come in and do their job, not only the birds, but also the microorganisms that benefit from carrion. We want a natural system. A historic part of the natural prairie ecosystem was grass fires. The Nature Conservancy in the U.S. has been experimenting with smallish grass fires to improve the grazing for their bison. Will Rewilding America now be doing prescribed burns? It's not something we want to do. You get bad fires when the mega herbivores are not there doing the job. You get a buildup over years of dead plants and then that kind of thing acts as tinder. If you've got mega herbivores eating as they're supposed to eat, then a lot of that is going to take care of itself. What I'm hearing is that the horses and the bison will remove fuel that would otherwise feed a grass fire. You just said that beautifully. It is all a question 
of what the fuel availability is and the conditions under which the burn is taking place. One of the interesting things about bison is that they create wallows where they roll around in the dust. The wallows fill with water and provide additional moisture to the prairie. And also increasing the biodiversity because you've got lots of organisms that can live in shallow ponds for at least part of the year. Horses do that a little bit when they're in very dry conditions. They can detect where the water table is at least comparatively close to the surface. And they will start digging down to a level where you get sufficient water appearing so that they can slake their thirst. The other animals can come in and take their fill and microorganisms that do well in aqueous conditions. I think it's all part of the grand scheme of nature, that nothing has a single purpose. A really highly productive ecosystem is going to have jobs for everyone, and it's going to have networks that everyone is involved in. And over time, if it is truly diverse and healthy, it can be self-sustaining. You don't need intervention. You need people to stay away. Let it do its thing. It will become as great as it can if you leave them alone. What we're trying to do with Birch Creek is to make enough of a difference so that we will not only have benefits like ecotourism, but we'll have carbon sequestration at a level that we would never be able to achieve under other circumstances. It's win-win. Ross, thanks so much for joining me today. It's been a great pleasure, Pamela. I've been talking to Dr. Ross McPhee, Curator Emeritus of Vertebrates at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City and Director and Head Science Advisor of Rewilding America Now. He joined me by phone from New York City. And that's the program for today. I'm Pamela Stagg. Thanks for joining me on The County Naturally. See you next week. This has been a presentation of 99.3 County FM, the voice of the county in Prince Edward County, Ontario, Canada.